Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm really enjoying it under the tent, especially now that the cold is gone. And today is really a really nice day. Not too hot, not too cold, but it's going to get warm in a little bit. We're preparing for that. I'm looking forward for the building, but I think that after we get the building, we'll sh we should from time to time spend a little time out here. Do I have a second to that motion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. aye. It is carried, okay. All right, so we look forward to that. So this morning, our message will be coming from the book of Jude. And it will be done in two parts. I'll be doing the first part this week and Keith Detweiler will do the other part next week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for this privilege that we can come into your presence. We thank you for the Sabbath day that is like a sanctuary in time where we can come apart and rest and be refreshed. Bless our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. Jude only writes one book with only one chapter. But it's pretty heavy. And so we're going to try our best to make it palatable today. If you if you'd like you turn your Bible to the book of Jude because we'll be going through that book pretty much verse by verse up until verse 11 and verse 1 says Jude a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ now it is believed that Jude was probably a half-brother to Jesus. And like he stated here, the brother of James. But you'll notice that Jude didn't uh, consider himself to even call himself the brother of Jesus, but the term he used was bond servant. Probably you want to dismiss any form of nepotism right here. And I think it's quite humbling for him to view himself as such, and we should do the same. But there are three words he used in this introduction, and those three words are called, sanctified, and preserved. You see, when we are called, we are declared righteous. When we are sanctified, we are being made righteous. And when, when we are reserved, we are kept righteous. And we see these terms also used in the book of Thessalonians, where it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, hear the word again, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Do you think that God is able to do what he said he will do? Of course he can. And we look at verse 2, it says, Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. I think Jude is kind of here describing the spirit of which we should present truth. It sounds like it borrows some language there from the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, etc. Any attempt to correct a brother or a sister must be done in the spirit of mercifulness, must be peaceful, and must be done in love. 
They say you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. In Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself less, thou also be tempted. And so that's the type of attitude we should have when we try to correct someone. And I think that's what Jude is alluding to here. And of course, in love, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Thou speak... Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could move mountains, but have not love, I am what? Nothing. What one word you could use to define love? One word. God, right? God is love, isn't it? Who exists first? God or words? God, right? So who should describe who? Words should describe God or God should describe words? God is a description of words. And so we find here that God is love. Our approach must always be in love or with God. And so what this text is telling us that whether we prophesy or we have faith or whatever we do, if we do not do it with God, which is love, we are nothing, zero, nil. We are not to contend like Moses did. You remember when Moses killed that Egyptian? He thought that was the way that God was going to deliver the Israelites. And so God had to send him back to school. And he had to go uh, lead sheep, sheep, not sheep, sorry, lead sheep for 40 years to unlearn the 40 years that he spent in Pharaoh's palace. Neither should we be like Peter. What did Peter do when they came to take Jesus. He pulled his sword and cut off a servant ear. That should not be our spirit in contending for the faith. Neither should we be like the world. We shouldn't be burning buildings or storming the capital. We must contend like Christ did. Verse 9 of this same chapter said, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him a reviling accusation, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. And so we are to avoid debate. And as a matter of fact, the devil here was trying, to, was trying to bring a legal case to Jesus because Jesus had not yet died and Moses sinned. He thought that his thinking was that Moses belonged to him because of his sin. But Jesus said, put it on my credit card. I'll come later and pay the debt. So Jesus resurrected Moses. We should not be distracted. I'll go looking for the bait. And don't get into confrontation, but stay focused on the mission. The verse also said, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. In verse 2. Not only shall we uh, display these virtues, but we should do it in abundance, not sparingly or occasionally. Multiplication is a mathematical term, which is more exponential than addition, while subtracting and dividing go in the opposite direction. So whatever we do, we must not subtract or divide, but we must multiply. Amen? Amen. I have a friend who... All right, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Verse 3 and 4 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you, 
to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, like we saw in the children's story, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of God into lewdness or lasciviousness or uh, without restraint or lawlessness, any of those words can use, and deny the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems as if James was about to write about the common salvation, but there were some issues going on that he had to address. And so he decided to forego what he was going to write and deal with these issues. In the same way, we should not hesitate to address issues that we face, and there are many. Pen and with voice. And we should not only defend issues that are popular, because when an issue is popular and everybody is behind it, you see a lot of posts on Facebook, and a lot of people have something to say in social media about it. But when it becomes something that's unpopular, when, it, when you're going to be censored or, or um, what's the term they use? Cancel you, you don't want to say anything. But we should say it in season and out of season. I believe this is what Jude was referring to when he said we should earnestly con contend for the faith, and he demonstrated it by example. Jude only write one book. If you had a, an opportunity to write one chapter in the Bible, what would you say? This is what Jude was saying to us. We should not be like Isaiah said. Uh, keeping quiet is not an option. Isaiah said that, talk about blind watchmen, dumb dogs who cannot bark. We don't want the week to be called that, do we? Jesus said we are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. So like somebody said, we must always try to be the salt in the pot. The people of God are the ones who should make a difference in society. Jude is admonishing us to earnestly contend for the faith. And this that was happening this time, it, was a, it wasn't a problem that was happening from the outside. It says evil men crept in. So this was happening from within. Now, how did that happen? They probably were, like the story says, wolves in sheep's clothing. Because that way, they would, um, would not be noticed. The devil seldom make drastic changes when he want to accomplish something. He usually you do little changes that you might not even notice. And over time, sometimes over many generations, then you want to say, how did we get here? There are things that used to amaze us, now amuse us. Some people just want enough Christianity to be respectable, but they don't want too much to be uncomfortable. That is why it's very important for us to study the Bible for ourselves. In 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing of truth. Notice it did not say read, it says study, there's a difference. The aim of these ungodly men, as Jude called them, is to turn the grace of God into, for a better term of the word, for a simpler term, lawlessness. And he gave three examples as he describes what was happening. I believe that in these examples we can see some of the issues that might have been going on. First example, Jude 1 5, not Jude 1 5, Jude 5, sorry. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. What is the problem here? 
What was their problem? It's right there. They did not what? They did not believe. When God told them that they could take the land, and after they sent in the 12 spies, 10 came back with a bad report, and two, only two came back with a report of confidence. It was just a short time since they left Egypt. They had seen the Red Sea departed. They had seen the plagues fall on Egypt. And now they think that God can't do what he said he would do. They did not believe. The Bible says we overcome the enemy by what? The blood of the lamb and something else. The word of our testimonies. We can't forget our testimonies. Oh, God have led us in the past. And that is critical to strengthen and to preserve our belief. Now, belief is a very important word. It, it keeps popping up everywhere as it relates to salvation. We see it in John 3.16 um, where it says, um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever what? Believe. He said, Abraham what? Believe God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And with a different word, with the same meaning, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So this is a very important word. Belief is more than a mental assent. It calls into action that which, al which is already confirmed in the heart. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Where people use the term belief and turn the grace of God into lawlessness. James 2.20 says, But do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And 18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy, thy faith without thy works, and I shall show you my faith by my works. Now let's be clear. Our works cannot save us. Right? But they have a purpose. James 2.12 says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So what we do is what God is going to use to judge us. Ecclesiastes tells us, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So, so works do have some... We're not talking about your works now. We're talking about the works which Christ should do, do for you. So it's, it's, it's critical for the judgment. Because remember that only God can read hearts. And in order for God to vindicate his name, there's something that got to show why you are saved. Right? Whatever we do through the power of God confirms our faith. James says it makes our faith complete. In the judgment, this is what will, be, will determine genuine faith. Because anybody can say they believe. There's a saying that says, it is faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. So Jude's concern was that these ungodly men wanted to turn the grace of God into lewdness or lordlessness, unrestrained, loose. So what does unbelief have to do with turning the grace of God into lawlessness? Now I saw this post on so, um, one of the social media platforms. Um, somebody who is a, a friend of mine, a, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, wrote this. We need to separate our, and I quote, we need to separate ourselves from the concept of perfection as part of any goal or dream we aspire to accomplish. Perfection is just not possible. Perfection isn't even necessary. Life will be fine without it. Cheers to being real. This person is probably an innocent victim to some erroneous teaching. But we're not talking about perfectionism here now. 
we are talking about God making you perfect. In Matthew 5, 48, it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Do you believe that? I didn't ask you if you can do it. I asked you if you believe it. Do you believe that? Yes, yes we believe that. Now, we have to be careful here. We don't go to the other extreme, right? We are being made perfect by the power of God, not us. In Revelation 10, it says something quite interesting here. Listen. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, starting from verse 5 to 7, and the earth lifted up his head to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that therein. And there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that's the final days, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to the servants of the prophets. So there is a mystery of God that needs to be finished, right? During the time of the seventh angel. And what is that mystery of God? We, found, we find the answer in Colossians chapter 1. It says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded, settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, where I, I Paul, am a, made a minister, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had hid for ages from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Jesus is waiting until his character is fully developed in us, and then he can come. In Christ's Objects lesson we read, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. We are all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory, or quickly the whole world would be sown and the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather his precious grain. So Christ is in the process of working on us to help us to, to become more like him. And when he can see his reflection in us, then he will come. This is probably what Jude was saying that we should earnestly contend for. Jude is writing about those who turn the grace of God into lawlessness talking about cheap grace. They do not believe that we can overcome. So there's hardly any difference between them and those of the world. There are many who desire, I know personally, include myself, who have habits that you want to get rid of. Would it be comforting to say to a person who is struggling with alcohol or who is struggling with smoking or porn or whatever they are struggling with, to say that, don't worry about it, it's okay. You're not expected to overcome anyway. Can we say that? No, we can't. This is the same struggle Paul had in Romans 7. But look at the solution he gave. In Romans 8, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free, from the law of sin, of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilling us. Do you believe that the righteousness of God can be fulfilling us? 
There are many promises that gives and tells us the ability that God has. For example, in Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And I like how the Bible uses adjectives. You see, when we speak, we use expressions, and so people can pretty much, because most of our communication is done through nonverbals. But because the Bible is not like that, it depends a lot on these adjectives to bring out the meaning. And so it says, exceeding abundantly above all, God is able. Abide in me, Jesus says, and I in you, this is how it's done. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And so the key is for us to abide in Christ. And abiding mean is to stay connected. Right? There's a story of a salesman way back in the day. He, sell, he, he, he sold vacuum cleaners. And he thought that his vacuum cleaners was the best you can ever have. And he went to this old country house, knocked on the door, and to demonstrate his product, he carried with him a bag of dust. And as he entered the house, before the woman could, uh, the homeowner could say anything, he dumped the bag of dust on the floor and started a sale pitch. And the lady said to him, you better start sucking because we don't have electricity. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good a vacuum cleaner he had. If it's not connected to the source, it's no good, no matter the brand. No matter how good a Christian we think we are, we have to be connected to Jesus. And when we are connected, overcoming is possible. Amen. Amen. In verse 11, it says we, um, that they go the, Cain, the way of Cain, right? And what was Cain's problem? Cain did not want to offer any sacrifice by blood, Right? Looks simple, but it's deeper than that. Let's do a little reverse engineering on that. So, in order for you to sacrifice blood, what you have to do? You have to kill the animal, right? So, Cain did not believe that, as a matter of fact, he thought that God was arbitrary, God was unfair. And he didn't think that death or, he, or death of an animal was a just penalty for what was done. He was kind of sympathizing with um, with Satan's side, probably. And so he decided not to offer no blood. Which is, uh, what were you saying now? It's a symbol of what Jesus would do. So in other words, say, um, uh, Cain was actually denying Christ in not offering blood. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says. For it is the power of and we've got to respect that word, power. It actually means dynamite. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jude says this, Now unto him, the, the, uh, Jude actually concludes with this in that same chapter, Unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of the glory with exceeding joy. So God is able. And we're going to move on now to, um, to the second uh, example that Jude used. And that is found in verse 6. Because this is the thing. When I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. Right? But when I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. So that's where our faith should be. Now the second example is found in verse 6. It says, and the angels... Who did not. So the first, there was kind of an unbelief going on where you can do whatever you want. You don't believe that Christ can make you right, right? The second one now is that, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, what is the issue here? Um, I, I, I kind of look into a different version just to see if it used different words. And in NLT version, it said it like this. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority. 
God gave them but God gave them but the, the authority God gave them but left the place where they belong God has kept them securely chained in prison of darkness waiting for the great day of judgment they had a problem with authority do we see that happening today it was Lucifer who said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He was not satisfied with the position he was given. He wanted no one above him, not even God. Lucifer had a problem with authority. Submission was not a part of his vocabulary. He was not going to have it. So he started like these ungodly men. He started his move in secret until it leads to open rebellion. And there are some biblical examples of this very same thing. We see the example of Aaron and Miriam. It says in Numbers 12, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman, whom he had married for he had married an Ethiopian woman so they said as the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses as he not spoken through us also and the Lord heard it and we know the rest of the story she got leprosy right but mercy prevailed the camp did not move forward until she was restored amen we serve a God of mercy so we got to be careful or we treat the Lord's anointed are those he put into position of authority. There's a, there's, a, there's a sad story in the Bible of Elisha. After Elijah was res, um, translated, some children were teasing him. And they were saying, go up, ball head, go up, ball head. And what happened? A bear came and killed them all. Even David, when he was given the opportunity that he could slay Saul, who didn't like him and was seeking to kill him, David did not want to touch the Lord's anointed. So we must respect God's authority. Amen? Here's another one. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. In number 16, they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Right? And the Lord said to Moses, bring, bring, um, before I get to Aaron's rod, now we know what happened in that story. They were destroyed. They were swallowed up. Right? Now, in the ark, in the side of the ark, there's Aaron's rod. You know why it's there? It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me. Because even after these guys got killed, they come to Moses and says, Why you destroy the people? <laughs> so God settled it with Aaron's rod. Right? And every man, all 12 tribes of Israel, brought their rods. And the rod that budded was the one that God chose. And Aaron rod did not only bud, but it bear ripe almonds. Right? So we should respect the authority of God. Even the disciples get affected by this. The disciples were always fighting who should be the greatest. It got to the point where the mother of two got involved and request on their behalf that one of, two of her sons, one sit on the right, one sit on the left, I don't know. I know mothers want good things for their children, but that seems to me like a, a kind of a selfish request. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, one on the right and one on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, they say unto him, we are able. The way how God sees authority is different from the way how the world sees it. Right? 
is not to lord it over people. We'll come into that in a few. And when the other ten disciples heard about it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. You see, this type of attitude for jostling for position always brings division. There's not a single example in scripture where competing for positions of authority have ever been fruitful to advance the cause of Christ. Therefore, it should be something we shun and we must earnestly contend against. We can see it manifest in our world today. Even the general term man, I mean, God placed man as the head of the household, right? Although they abuse it sometimes, a lot of times. But even the generic term man is under attack. I was listening to an automotive program the other day, and there is a, a truck company by the name of Man in Europe. And the person who was commenting on the, the product was saying they had a bad day when they named the company Man, <laughs> right? Even Mr. Potato announced that they're taking away the Mr. Potato. And I even hear that master bedroom probably going to change. I notice that men in movies are taking a more, not a leadership role, and in advertisement. When an assassinator is going to assassinate somebody, what part of the body they aim for? The head. I think the devil is aiming at the head. It's not the first time he did this. When Moses was born, who did the Pharaoh give um, command to kill? All the boy babies. When Jesus was about to come, who did Herod give command to kill? All the boy babies. Men in our world today has reached an all-time low, generally speaking. Many of the men I know in my family and otherwise are doing poorly. Women are doing better. Women are doing their thing, right? That's good, but men are faltering. I think that there is an attack on men. He wants to assassinate by killing the head. And there's also Reb, um, rebellion against authority that is disguised as equality. Now stay with me now. You'll understand my point as I move on. Are we wiser than angels? We are not, right? Because we are made a little bit lower than them. Well, the devil deceived one third of them. What chance do you and I have without Christ, right? So these subtle things we've got to be careful of. The, fall, the false equality is a danger to unity or the church as a body. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, If a foot should say, because I am not the, um, I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the earring? If the whole were earring, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Right? It is God who put people into whatever position uh, he needs them to go. Has he pleased? Wherever God plants us, we are to be bloom where we are planted. With this mindset, we'll never get anything done. Have you ever worked at a job where everybody wants to be the boss? Or on a team where everybody wants to be the captain? It only leads to chaos. God never have us do something, ask us to do something that he himself will not do. Philippians 2, 5 to 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, 
and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and become obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. And because Jesus took this humble position, he submitted himself to the authority of his father, we got salvation. Can you imagine if Jesus had rebelled and claimed that he wants equality? We would not be saved. But instead, Jesus said, not my will, thy will be done. When authority and submission is properly used, it is a wonderful thing. To go against it will bring destruction, like Jude is telling us will happen to the evil angels. On the contrary, within the Godhead, it brings salvation. And this stag staggered arrangement, the selfish heart cannot be contented with, with this staggered arrangement that God have, with giving different people different role and placing different people on different levels. We see it in the Godhead, where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and even distributing of the talents, where he gave one five, he gave one two, and he gave one one, according to their ability, right? And Joseph also used this to prove his brother. You remember when his brother came and he was serving food, what did he do? He gave the youngest one the most, just to check if they had changed. The converted heart have no problem with this type of arrangement. And they did, and they did change because they were willing to even give up themselves to save their younger brother. And even the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, we see where the older brother was making this claim. I've been with you all this time and you're giving this, this one brother who has gone and lived a righteous, not righteous, but riotous life. And you're keeping a party for him and you did nothing for me, right? Trying to get this equality thing, this false equality thing going. And even Jesus, when he says, leave in the 90 and 9, he goes to save the one, right? And this sinful earth is going to eventually become the capital of the entire universe. Now, what do you think the unfallen worlds are going to think about that? They have never sinned. They have never done wrong, and yet Jesus took this sinful earth and made it his headquarters. Because they are perfect people, they have no problems. As a matter of fact, they rejoice. Didn't the Bible say we should esteem others above ourselves? That's, it takes a converted heart to do that. We can't naturally do it. If you and another co-worker is in a job, and you think that you are better than them, I didn't say you are better than them, you think you are better than them, and they got the promotion, are you going to congratulate them? The selfish heart can't do that. Right? Jesus admonishes this. But Jesus called unto himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right? So Jesus' type of authority, this authority and submission thing, is different from how the world sees it. Right? There's going to come a day when everyone is going to accept the authority of God. But to some, it's going to be too late. The Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we must earnestly contend for these principles that works for our good. And the third, the third example that Jude used is found in verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set for as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What is the problem here? Sexual immorality and strange flesh. All right? Now, before we get into that, let's backtrack a little bit. Before the angels went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses interceded for them. 
right? And Moses said, if there were 50, would you destroy? And what the angel says, no. Then he goes down to 45, then 40, then 30. He eventually stopped at 10 and said, if 10 were there, would you destroy? And they would not destroy the city because of 10. Remember those three words um, uh, Jude used in his introduction? Called, sanctified, and preserved. The Israelites were called out of Egypt. The angels were sanctified, and they left their place. And there was not even 10 to preserve the city. Those who are intolerant to Christians don't have a clue that it is the presence of God's people that preserve the cities that we live in. If it wasn't for God's people, a lot of bad things would happen. That's the lesson we are getting here. It says in Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But Jesus said in Peter, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's not God's, it, uh, uh, it's a strange act when he got to destroy somebody, right? God's love the sinner, but he hates the sin. Many who are involved in these practices, sexual immorality, are, are indulging strange flesh. We're going to use that term. Not to get caught up with the, algor uh, the algorithms. Strange flesh. God wants to save them too. Amen? In fact, there are many ministries that provide support and help. Another thing that this type of movement does is that there, there is a paradigm shift happening in our world today. The shift is not tending toward helping the structure of the family as God designed it. In other words, there is an attack on the nuclear family structure, and it's not a good thing. This shift, shift will open a can of worms, and pretty soon we might see every sexual misconduct get legalized. Then there is also a gender issue, which is akin to this. The enemy of souls is just trying to erase the image of God from the human race. But what baffles me is how preachers can use scripture to justify these acts. I don't get it. Things are wrapping up. Every event is letting us know that the time is near. This practice has become law in many countries. What two institutions did God put in the Garden of Eden? Marriage and the Sabbath. Now, a counterfeit marriage is law in many countries. What do you think will come next? We know that like every other thing that is against God will lead to destruction. But what I like about God is that he always gives an opportunity for someone to be saved before the destruction comes. When Adam and Eve sinned, he told them that they would die the day they sinned. Mercy stepped in. God came down and he talked with them. He shouldn't have no business talk with them. He should just come and execute. But he come and he talked with them. And he killed a lamb and provided them covering. Right? Noah preached for 120 years. God's always stretching out the olive branch, trying to reach others. Right? Lot called his family. When the angels go to destroy, went to destroy Saddam, they did not go and execute judgment immediately. They spent all night and sent Lot to go try and reach his family. I guess was trying to, to see if they could find 10 but they couldn't. Another, another point that um, in passing that uh, Jude mentioned here is the fact of burning in eternal fire. This debunked the idea that God burned people forever. 
that's not a loving God. And this false teaching caused a lot of people to become atheists. And the fact that he used eternal fire, the term eternal fire here, referring to Sodom and Gomorrah, shows us the term eternal fire doesn't mean that it keeps going on forever. The way all fire works, if there's nothing to be burnt, it will go out, right? And the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. So there's no eternal burning. And Jude 10 and 11 says, but these speak evil of what they, whatever they do not know. And whatever they know, naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perish in the rebellion of Korah. Now we see three examples of three false or fake teachers here. And it gives us a little hint, our symptoms, of what all fake uh, 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 preachers or apostates use. And what did Cain use? He prosecuted. So whenever you see an entity doing persecution, red flag, that's not of God. And Balaam, he loved money. Whenever you see an, an, an entity just going after money, money is all they care, like a lot of the prosperity gospel that we see. Got to question it. Red flag. And Korah was the rebellion of authority. Whenever we see that, red flag. Not be of God. And they move secretly like wolves in sheep clothes. These are some of the symptoms of a false teacher. False teachers. Because we are called, sanctified and preserved, this godly symptoms must be, like was mentioned earlier, mercy, peace, and love. One of the longest words in the dictionary is forever. We are called, we are sanctified, and we will preserve, will be preserved forever. Forever is a long time, and that is without sin. As a matter of fact, for God to destroy sin and sinners is a blessing to them. Because living forever in sin will be miserable. The Bible says that he that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, my wife is in Jamaica. I'm going to conclude with this. My wife is in Jamaica, and I'm leaving tomorrow morning. She has a niece that is very sick. And she need blood. But everyone that have her blood type, when they come to give blood, there is always something wrong. Either blood pressure too high or some medical issue they can't get to give blood. <coughs> so one of the things when I go, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to give some blood. <coughs> it reminds me of this sin sick world that only can be redeemed by blood. And there is only one blood type in the entire new universe that can redeem us. And that is the blood of Jesus. So let us earnestly contend for the faith and let us be faithful until the end.